Um, and uh, we're going to move now to another topic, which is really central, which is labor market effects. Let me explain to you a little bit about how we're going to do this session. Um, first, I'm going to uh, beg the speakers uh, to keep to their 15 minute time limits. Um, in another iteration of the Brookings uh, virtual conference software, there's going to be a big countdown clock and your faith is going to be obscured at 14 minutes and 59 seconds, but I don't have that yet. So we have three papers on labor market effects and two discussants, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, uh, I think I'll introduce the papers as they go so we just people can keep track. And again, if you're in the Zoom room and have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And if you're watching online, feel free to email them to events at brookings.edu. Um, the first paper is what is the impact of opportunity zones on employment outcomes? This is by Rachel Atkins, Pablo Hernandez Lagos, and Rob Siemens at NYU, and uh, Christian Yara Figueroa at MIT. And Rob will make the presentation. So Rob, the screen is yours. Great, thank you, David. Let me just pull up my slides here. You can hear me okay? Yep, great. Okay, and you can see the slides okay? Great. Okay, good. Um, so David, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to present our work. Uh, let me just briefly say at the outset, I apologize in advance if you hear my kids in the background. It's you know sort of one of those days and, and the nature of life uh, here, uh, here in New York and, and with COVID. So I'm Rob Siemens, I'm a professor at NYU. You, can, you just heard a moment ago about my co-authors, Pablo, Rachel, and Chris. Uh, the title of our paper is, What is the Impact of Opportunity Zones on Employment? And so we are very specifically focused on employment. Um, because that is one of the desired outcomes of this program. So David, at the start of the program, at the start of the program today, uh, very succinctly described opportunity zones. Here's another way to think about opportunity zones. This comes from the Council of Economic Advisors Economic Report of the President. Opportunity zones chart a new course in federal policy aimed at uplifting distressed communities. OZs cut taxes to increase economic activity by spurring private sector investment, job creation, and self-sufficiency. So in this paper, we're gonna be focused very explicitly on job creation. Other papers are focused on other dimensions. You know, later this afternoon, we'll hear a lot about the private sector investment. We are focused on job creation. And in particular, we're focused on uh, job creation in distressed communities because that is an explicit uh, desire of this, of this program. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Um, first, we use burning glass, job posting, and posted wages data from January of 2015 to December of 2020. I'll say more about that on the next slide. We're gonna be focused on zip codes, uh, okay, as opposed to census tracts. I'll, I'll describe a little bit more about that on the next slide as well. Um, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at zip codes that have one or more opportunity zones uh, in them. And we're gonna compare them to other uh, zip codes that have uh, that, that could have had a, a track that qualified as an opportunity zone, uh, but didn't, okay? And we're gonna call these our control uh, zip codes. And we are very intentionally focused on, only on the, the low income status uh, uh, census tracts. That's intentional, again, because the goal of the program is to uplift distressed communities. And so we want to assess the, the extent to which the program was able to do that. Um, with these in hand, right, our sort of treated and control zip codes, we're then going to compare job vacancies and wages in the treated zip codes to these closely matched zip codes pre and post the opportunity zone designation. And we will also talk a little bit about uh, some early findings that we have um, on the effects of COVID on these opportunity zones. So why are we using the burning glass data? So some of you are probably fairly familiar with this data. For those of you that aren't, uh, what burning glass does is they capture nearly the universe of job postings. These are from online job boards that get scraped and processed by burning glass. So we have the job postings. We also have wages for a subset of those job postings, okay, but we're missing wages for all of them. And so there, there is sort of a selection issue there that we will have to deal with and I'll talk more about a little bit later on. It also turns out that for this burning glass data, the, the data is better at the zip code level as opposed to the census tract level. And so we're gonna be aggregating from the census tract level up to the zip code level. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on about uh, the trade-offs that are involved with that. It's gonna perhaps make our, our data a little bit noisier, but there are various robustness checks that we can do to see whether that's impacting anything that we're finding. If you will, those are the downsides of the data, uh, a ton of upsides to the data. First of all, the data is really timely. So we're aggregating this job posting data to the monthly level. We could aggregate it even finer to the weekly level if we wanted to, but we're aggregating it to the monthly level from January 2015 all the way to December 2020. Okay, so very timely. Um, we've done a fair bit of work 
validating that this burning glass data is actually a good leading indicator of employment outcomes. Uh, so in the paper, we present some of this, uh, where we correlate the burning glass data to quarterly census of employment and wages and to zip code business pattern data. Uh, in addition, a variety of other academics, I've listed some of them here, this is just a small subset of the folks that have done this, uh, have also validated uh, that this data is quite reliable uh, and is very useful for assessing employment outcomes. Okay, so what are the steps? So first step is we're gonna talk a little bit about selection, right? We heard a moment ago uh, that the entire session was on selection. So it's very important to, to think about selection. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about the characteristics of census tracts that were designated as opportunity zones. Uh, we're gonna use that to, uh, to, to sort of motivate this propensity score approach that we do. And then what we're gonna do is for each state, and again, you heard why it's important to do this on sort of a state by state basis, given all the uh, variability at, e at each state. Um, for each state, we will then predict census tract opportunity zone designation. We will aggregate these predictions to the zip code level and then match the, what we're gonna call the treated zip codes to similar zip codes with no opportunity zone tracts. Then again, with our sort of treated and controlled zip codes, we're gonna uh, take this to data, right? We, we, we have a panel data set up. We're gonna run a number of panel data regression models where we compare job postings and posted wages across these treated and controlled zip codes. Um, uh, we have an, an additional sort of selection issue to deal with with the wages that I'll talk about uh, or I'll touch on briefly in a moment. Um, and then we run a variety of robustness uh, tests and we also talk about the treatment heterogeneity. Okay, so first on selection. Again, we, we heard a lot about this uh, in the past hour. Um, I am intentionally suppressing some of the output here just so we can focus on a few things that we think are pretty interesting. So what we're doing here is at the census tract level, we are predicting um, uh, which census tracts are selected as opportunity zones. Um, a few interesting things to point out here. Uh, first thing I wanna point out is the same party, Democrat and, and Republican. Th this should remind you of the, of the paper by Lester and colleagues. So what we're finding is that when the governor is the same party as the uh, local state representative who, over who sort of represents that, that uh, census tract, it is more likely that that zone is then designated as an opportunity zone. Sorry, that that tract is designated as an opportunity zone. Um, th this is perhaps splitting, if you will, what uh, Lester et al. do. We look at uh, Democrat versus Republican, that the effect is more, more strong for sort of Republican governor and Republican representative. So that's sort of one thing to point out. The other thing to point out, and again, you heard about this in the prior papers as well, is that the uh, tracks that were selected to be opportunity zones, right? So here we're looking at income growth. Th these were tracks that were, if you will, sort of already uh, on a good trajectory, okay? Um, we are agnostic as to whether that's a good or a bad thing, whether it represents favoritism or anything like that. We just think it's really important to point out that there is a ton of selection um, at play here. And so that motivates uh, our approach of coming up with a, a treated and a, and a control, a propensity score matched uh, control sample. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a moment on, 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 on this slide. So what we're doing here is we are, th this is raw data. We are plotting for each of the months in our, in our data set, uh, the number of job postings. And what we're gonna do, if you first focus on the blue ones, I, I'm focused on the upper panel here. If you look at the blue ones, uh, these are the um, zip codes that have census tracts that were designated as opportunity zones. Okay, so you can see pre-2018 and then post-2018, so from January 2019 after. Okay, um, you see I've got this gray bar here for 2018. What we're going to do, and, and we'll talk about robustness checks as well, but what we're going to do is we're going to say pre-opportunity zone is before 2018, post-opportunity zone is after 2018, so 2019 and after. Uh, our reasons for doing this are uh, related to some of the remarks you heard from Keenan ear earlier this morning about sort of uh, how long it took uh, for, the, for this uh, program to sort of unfold during the year of 2018, as well as some of the other selection things that are going on during 2018 that we heard from the prior speakers. Um, so the first thing to notice is that uh, when it comes to job postings, these zip codes that are blue are uh, you know, there's a level difference between those and the ones that are green. So what are the ones that are green? These are all of the zip codes that could have qualified uh, for, for having an opportunity zone in them, uh, but didn't, okay? And so it, again, it suggests that there really is some, some selection effects at play here. And so what we do is we come up with these closely matched zip codes. These are the ones in orange. You can see they track pretty well prior to the, the opportunity zone designation. And then you can see what the effects are uh, afterwards, okay? On the bottom panel, what, what we've got is the difference between the blue and the orange, 
Okay, you can see it sort of hovers, uh, it's a little below zero, but you know, around zero uh, pre-designation. And then post-designation, there's perhaps an uptick. And then in particular, there, there's a real uptick that we noticed uh, once COVID hit. So that, that's this the sort of narrow gray bar right here. Now, if you will, this is sort of, again, this is just raw data, but this, this sort of summarizes our paper in a nutshell. Okay, there's a, perhaps a little bit of a post uh, opportunity zone designation effect on employment. It turns out it's not going to be statistically significant. Really, there's an effect during this COVID period. Okay, so now what we're going to do is put a little bit more structure on this. So what we're interested in, this is our outcome over here. We're interested in job postings in zip code J in, in uh, month T. We're going to include the zip code and uh, month fix effects. And then what we're interested in is what happens in that zip code J uh, post, uh, post opportunity zone. And then we will also include this post COVID uh, effect as well. We are gonna cluster our errors, uh, both at the zip code and the state level. Uh, we, we've, we've done it at other levels too that I'm happy to talk about. It's gonna turn out that the, the, the basic story doesn't really change depending on clustering. Uh, to the extent that it does, then I think it's just worth keeping in mind, right, right as researchers, it's worth keeping in mind uh, whether we want to try to be finding an effect um, you know, versus sort of being as transparent as possible about uh, what, what the results might say. Okay, so what do the results say? Um, let's focus on column one here. This is number of, so this is job postings, right, or, or I guess we also say vacancies. Um, this is our, you know, the, the effect of uh, the treatment on the treated um, we, we have our controls in here as well. We are clustering it at the zip code level. We see this positive effect, but it's, it's not significant. If we cluster a bit broader at the state level, again, the significance goes down even more. We introduce this post-COVID um, dummy here. And again, you, you, you can start to see an effect there, but again, it's gonna be sensitive to how you cluster the standard errors. Uh, so that's employment. Uh, here's wage. So wage, we do see um, an effect that is robust to however you want to do the clustering. Now recall one of the issues with wages here, if you look at the N here, the number of observations for vacancies, it's you know 675,000 or so. When we look at wages, we're about 400,000, right? So we're losing some observations because we don't have the wage data um, uh, for, for as many of the periods and as many of the zip codes as we do for the employment. Okay, so perhaps, so a selection issue going on there uh, we have a way of, of correcting that that I'm happy to, to talk more about offline. Uh, again, we do see a positive, statistically significant, uh, small, whether it's meaningful or not, uh, the discussants might have something to say on that, uh, but we do see an effect here on wage. Um, we have a variety of other uh, results, some of which are in the paper. Well, I should mention that the paper that we have posted, um, you know, this, this is sort of real time, David, I, I hope you appreciate that. Uh, the, uh, a lot of the results I'm showing you today are taking advantage of some um, uh, some of what we've learned, frankly, from reading the papers by um, uh, some of the other co-authors that are, or some sorry, some of the other authors that are presenting today, uh, including the authors that presented this morning on uh, the large amount of selection going on. And so we, we've been rerunning some of our uh, results, and so not all of this is is in the paper, but it's um, it's in the process of being updated. Uh, so we talked about clustering. Uh, we can talk about other different time varying controls that we include or not. We can talk about other ways of saying what is the pre-period and post-period. Um, we can talk about comparing the treated zip codes to all qualified zip codes as opposed to just the propensity score ones that we created. Um, in all cases, you know, the results are basically the same. The results are basically that there's perhaps some evidence of a positive increase in employment, but it is not a statistically significant effect in employment uh, post uh, opportunity zone designation. Um, let me set aside some of the other heterogeneous effects. I can talk more about that later. Um, so how do we interpret this? So little evidence that opportunity zone uh, designation is associated with higher job postings in low income opportunity zone areas. There is, however, some evidence that maybe this is starting to increase over time. And, and again, keep in mind we, you know, what we showed with that post COVID period, it does look like it is increasing over time. One of the challenges, of course, is sort of disentangling how much of that is due to something specific to the opportunity zone, as opposed to other types of policies that may have been put in place uh, um, uh, because of COVID. Um, so how, how would we summarize what we've got? So job postings are a good indicator of employment outcomes. So far, no evidence that, the, that opportunity zones have led to employment gains, uh, comma, yet. We think that's an important caveat. 
opportunity zones are relatively new, the, the effect on employment uh, could still manifest in the future. And I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next paper is titled Job Growth from Opportunity Zones. Uh, the authors are Elena Areva, Areva of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, Morris Davis of Rutgers, Andrea Ghent of UNC, and uh, Mincion Park also of University of Wisconsin. The presentation will be by Alina Areva. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for putting the paper on the program. It's so great to see it among um, other amazing papers on opportunity zones. Um, but let me get into it. So um, as the previous paper, we are studying, uh, studying the effect of opportunity zones on um, uh, its intended outcome, which is the job growth. Um, so that's our main research question. And we use the difference in difference uh, strategy to show that um, after 2017 to 2019, the program increased employment and establishment growth in targeted tracts by three to 4.6 percentage points. And it did so by encouraging entry of new establishments with the largest effects seen in construction and real estate related industries. And this uh, growth uh, is broad based across industries with different skill levels. And perhaps surprisingly, we also um, see evidence of positive spillovers to nearby tracts. So I'll skip the details of the program uh, because we talked a lot about um, that uh, in the beginning of the conference, uh, but uh, let me highlight uh, that we're using a similar strategy um, to uh, previous papers, which is comparison between designated tracts and eligible tracts that were not designated um, by the program. And here's a picture for New York that illustrates our empirical strategy. So uh, in the uh, empirical strategy, we use all the data from uh, all uh, 87,000 uh, tracts um, and um, our main data set will be uh, your economy time series. Uh, so this is a establishment level data uh, for employment from 97 to 2019 that covers all US public and private establishments. And uh, this data is similar to uh, more standard BLS data sets in terms of um, coverage and quality. Uh, and we have references um, about that in the paper. However, this data does not allow us to uh, see where people uh, live. So we can only say uh, what happens with employment on the establishment level, and we're looking forward to evidence from other papers on what happens uh, with locations of, of workers. But in the paper, we use um, track level data set as our main data set. So what we do is with some um, establishment level data, so some all employment and count the number of establishments in the tract to get to our track level analysis. And then we uh, supplement this data set with a, a list of eligible tracks from Urban Institute and uh, American Community Survey, uh, where we take the covariates before the start of the policy. So here are summary statistics for our uh, data set. Um, on the right, you can see means for designated opportunity zones. And on the left, you can see means for tracks that were eligible, but were not designated um, as opportunity zones. And this is before the start of the policy. So few things um, uh, are uh, becoming prominent right away. Uh, first, before the start of the policy, those tracks that were eventually selected um, um, had um, higher employment to start with but also experience lower employment growth prior to the start of the policy. Moreover, you can see the uh, American uh, community uh, survey controls that we're using uh, that are pretty standard um, um, to what other papers are doing. Uh, but um, the important part is that you can see that those tracts are heterogeneous in terms of those controls. So how do we make sure that uh, the uh, pre-trends actually hold uh, for those uh, tracks that are a little bit different. Uh, so first we uh, do standard pre-trends graph, which you can see on the slide. So on x-axis, we have two-year growth periods. 
uh, for example, 2019 corresponds to growth from 2017 to 2019. And on y-axis, uh, you can see our main um, dependent variable, which is the employment growth. And then two graphs correspond to uh, the two groups that we are comparing. So designated uh, line, the red line is designated opportunity zones and blue dashed line is de uh, eligible uh, tracks that were not designated. And you can see that prior to 2017, uh, the trends in employment growth are uh, pretty similar. And uh, we also do additional analysis where we estimate our main model before the start of the policy. Uh, so we regress um, employment or establishment growth on prior growth on controls. And we also include or not include designation dummy. And then what we do is we predict, um, predict in sample and out of sample, so predict um, for 2017 to 2019 period, uh, what was the um, predicted growth? And then the graphs that you will see will show you the actual growth minus the predicted growth using our model estimated before the start of the policy. So here are the graphs for um, establishment growth. Uh, the only difference between the uh, two graphs that you're seeing is that on the right, we included designation dummy uh, in our model, and then on the left, we didn't. And on the right, the average errors are zero because we um, included this dummy. Um, but just looking at the picture, you can see the, uh, it doesn't seem like there was a um, big trend before the start of the policy. Uh, but after the start of the policy, when we do the out of sample prediction, we can see that actual um, establishment growth exceeds the uh, predicted establishment growth based on our model. And actually the difference, uh, the predicted difference is similar to our empirical estimates. All right, um, and that's similar for uh, employment growth. So let me get into our uh, main research design. So <clears throat> we do two way fixed effects. So difference and difference, um, regression growth and employment or establishment growth on post dummy, uh, treatment dummy uh, and their interaction. And we control for census tract characteristics um, that I've shown you before. So one other thing to note is that uh, we see some outliers in our data, uh, like for example, 400,000 uh, percent employment growth, uh, and we report those stats in the paper. Uh, so to eliminate um, um, influence of those outliers, we will prefer specifications that are not impacted as much by outliers, such as quantile regression, or for less, we will benzerize uh, the dependent variable at 1%. And because of lack of time, uh, let me skip to uh, our main estimates. So here, what we do is we divide the sample into two parts. Uh, the, the left side, columns one and two, <clears throat> show our estimates for um, uh, urban tracts, so tracts in metro areas. And then columns three and four show our estimates for tracts in more rural areas, which we define as those that are not in metro areas. And the highlighted uh, numbers show our estimates of the impact of the program. First thing to note is that the right side, so the rural tracts, seems like there was not a huge impact of the uh, program on the employment growth, while in, um, on the left side, um, we see a positive significant impact of the program on urban tracts. And specifically, um, if we look at um, column one, which is the quantile regression, and column two, which is or less with dependent variable vinzerized, we can see that estimates vary from three to 4.6 percentage points, which will be uh, our benchmark estimates uh, in the paper. And um, here we already control for prior employment growth, we control for uh, American Community Survey um, um, and controls, and we uh, uh, use only our preferred specifications. All right, so now we want to make sure that our results are robust. Uh, so we do a lot of robustness checks, including dividing the sample into low income tracts or those that are contiguous. Um, and what we see is that for low income communities, the estimates are pretty close to baseline. 
And then for those that are contiguous communities, estimates are higher, but um, also the standard errors are higher because we lose a lot of sample. So there's only like 85 opportunity zones that are left. Um, so it doesn't seem to make a big difference um, for our results. Then we do a more classic placebo test where we pretend that designation happened in 2015 instead of 2017. And we regress per designation outcomes on designation dummy, this new redefined uh, post dummy and their interaction. And it seems like we mostly pass uh, this placebo test, uh, which um, um, uh, really comforts us in terms of uh, robustness of our results. We we'll also um, follow Frank Hoops and Lester in uh, checking that uh, the political affiliation, whether political affiliation was important for our results. So we uh, replicate uh, their variable, which is the same party, Dami. And so the share of the lower track house representatives that belong to the same party. And we control for this variable and we also create interaction term um, uh, and include that interaction term in our estimates. And what we see is that um, it doesn't make a huge difference. So when we control, estimates are pretty much the same. When we include interaction term, um, either it's um, insignificant or if anything, it reduces employment and establishment growth. And finally, we do uh, one of the estimates, uh, thanks to um, uh, Kevin, um, Ed and David, um, who shared th their code with us, uh, which is a, a variation of the propensity score estimate, which is called doubly robust difference and difference. Um, so this is the estimator uh, that allows for propensity score model or the main empirical model to be misspecified and it still uh, will produce robust um, estimates. And what we see is that estimates uh, are actually even higher than our baseline. So four, uh, sorry, uh, five percentage points for employment growth and around four or five percentage points for establishment growth. So now finally, once we establish that the program creates uh, positive employment uh, growth, how the program actually creates new employment. So first thing we've done is uh, dividing, is testing whether the program creates employment through intensive margin, so through existing establishments or new establishments, so extensive margin. And no matter how we define existing establishments, we see that the program uh, does not um, significantly impact those establishments. So we conclude that the uh, new establishments, so creation of new establishments or extensive margin is driving this positive employment growth. Now we also want to see um, the uh, how the policy impacts different industries and um, who actually gets hired. So for our heterogeneity over industries, we use Mian Sufi classification. We divide all industries into four categories that are listed at the bottom. So with construction, we have pure construction, any real estate development um, or development industries. Non-tradables include. Uh, retail or restaurants. Tradables include all industries that have a big share of imports and exports, and others include all industries that in didn't fit into previous uh, categories. The bars represent our estimates of the impact of the program, with the left bars being the benchmark estimates, 4.6 percentage points for employment growth and 4.2 percentage points for establishment growth. And then on the right, um, we present our estimates on a SAP sample of industries of that specific type. And what we can see is that the biggest um, impact of the policy was on construction related industries, um, which um, uh, perhaps is not surprising given um, our discussions today. But even if we exclude construction and only run our model on all other industries, we can still see positive significant impact on other industries as well. Now, um, a lot of policymakers were concerned that the policy will be creating employment only for high-skilled workers. So to test that, we use um, Aldensky's skill intensity measure that measures average educational level of labor used in industry. It goes from high, some high school education to graduate school. And then we divide the sample uh, into um, two or five parts, depending on the level of the skill intensity measure. And here represents our results based on the subsamples. 
So the left bars, again, represent our benchmark results. <clears throat> then you can see results when we divide um, the sample into two parts. And then the uh, remaining bars represent uh, our estimates for division the sample into five parts based on the skill intensity measure. And what you can see is that uh, the effect of the policy is broad based across industries with different skill levels, not only high skilled workers. And if anything, the biggest impact uh, was for those industries that have uh, median skill level. Um, moreover, we have um, some additional heterogeneity results, but let me quickly uh, tell you about the spillover results. So the big question here, um, as Ed mentioned, is whether the policies are effective and uh, um, whether the policies <laughs> simply shift employment from nearby tracks to designated tracks, or maybe alternatively, the presence of opportunity zones uh, can create some agglomeration spillovers. So to test this, we'll extend our sample to include tracks that are contiguous to all eligible tracks, and then tracks that are contiguous to contiguous tracks and so forth up to four levels of contiguity. And then we include a treatment dummy for those contiguous tracts that basically allow us to compare tracts that are uh, contiguous to designated tracts with tracts that are contiguous to eligible but not designated tracts to measure spillovers to nearby tracts. Uh, so here's uh, here are my uh, 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 remaining results. Uh, where in column one, you can see <clears throat> our benchmark results for 4.5 percentage points. Uh, but let me uh, turn your attention to column two that shows the results, um, uh, the estimates for the spillover effects. So you can see that the spillover effect on the contiguous track, on the contiguous tracks was about two percentage points. And then uh, the same is true for second level of contiguity. And then the effect completely dies off. So this uh, suggests that there could, could be some positive spillovers uh, to nearby tracks. So let me conclude as uh, because I'm out of time. So what we're arguing here is that opportunity zones created uh, employment and establishment growth and increased it by three to 4.6 percentage points in census tracts that were located in metro areas. And the policy worked through encouraging entry of new establishments with the largest effects uh, for construction industries. And this effect is similar across industries with different skill levels, uh, with uh, some um, evidence of positive spillovers to nearby tracts. And uh, there are bigger questions to be addressed here, um, such as whether the effect of the policy is temporary or permanent, uh, which we will see uh, once a new data is released, and whether they, um, the, the program is a cost-effective way of creating employment relative to other employment creation programs. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and uh, learning from other papers as well. Great, thank you very much. And the final paper, similar title, different conclusions, the labor market effects of opportunity zones and their benefits for opportunity zone residents by three economists at the University of California, Irvine, David Newmark, Matthew Friedman, and Shatanu Khanna. David Newmark will present. David? You see my slides? Because I can never tell. We hear you. Thank you. And you see my slides. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so this is joint work with, with Matt and Shantanu, who is a grad student, be on the market next year. You should all hire him, or at least one of you. Um, let me. Huh. The screen you're seeing is not. There we go. Okay. Um, this is a nice venue to present in because I don't have to explain about opportunity zones because you all know about them and we've heard already. Uh, about them. Um, I think um, it's just useful to put these in context a little bit. This is my perspective. I mean, Ed Glazer did a little bit of this in a somewhat different perspective. OZs are a new place-based policy, um, obviously targeting incentives through investors in property. Uh, I think it, for the US context, the key prior place-based policy is enterprise zones. That, that's kind of the alternative framework we think about. Um, which again, I'd mentioned this directly target the hiring of low skilled workers. Obviously there are parallels to other things like the new markets uh, tax credit. When it comes to enterprise zones, uh, at least um, the evidence is very spotty. Uh, I think that these have created jobs um, and I, some of the references are here, I won't go through them. Um, even in uh, the case of research that suggests they do, and that would particularly apply to federal empowerment zones where maybe the evidence is somewhat more positive. 
Uh, we also fail to see, I think, that benefits go to the low income residents, the targeted places. So even when there is job growth, the distributional effects uh, don't seem to be uh, what was intended. And again, finding the, the new markets tax credit is, um, which I love to talk about since my last name is Newmark, um, uh, have led to more real estate investment. Uh, and Matt Friedman, my co-author, has a, a well-cited paper on this, uh, but pretty modest and costly poverty reduction. Uh, if, we, if we kind of filter things through that lens. Uh, so the obvious question then is, do, enter, do opportunity zones do any better? I don't actually know as much as I should about uh, the genesis of this program and the extent to which it was meant to be a reaction to um, what I would call as the failure might be too strong a word, but the spotty evidence on enterprise zones. Um, but obviously the comparison is interesting. So uh, an overview of what we do, we provide early evidence on the, the impact of, of Opportunity Zone designation um, uh, through 2019. Uh, we look at residents, and which is, which is exactly, not the exactly opposite, but diff, fundamentally different from, from the, the paper you just heard. Um, and we look at, you know, through two, really two key outcomes, employment and poverty, and we also look at earnings. Um, uh, not quite as fundamentally interesting because those can reflect compositional effects, but we, you know, if we, if we found effects on employment, we kind of want to know, are we creating more high earnings jobs or are we maybe bringing in low earnings people? So earnings are, are relevant, but not the key outcome. I think the key uh, advantage we have in this paper is uh, we, we had a lot of foresight um, in, the, in the sense we have census approval to, to, to use our data to study this already. Um, so we have, we have access to the restricted access uh, ACS data so we can get the annual data at the track level. Uh, and use them, which is, which is great. Um, you know, the public data are five-year averages, which we're looking at a program which sort of, you know, rolled out in 2018, probably took effect merely in 2019, uh, and then COVID hit, so that screws us up for the next few years. Um, you know, being able to get at the, um, uh, the, the, the one-year data is obviously great. Um, you'll see a common uh, approach to identification strategies, not exactly the same way, but the same questions that these other papers have asked. Um, and I think we find what we would call, to call very limited evidence of positive impacts of residents on, of, of targeted neighborhoods. Um, uh, you just saw the first paper cited here on jobs in jobs in track that's held by people working in tracks without without reference to residents. Um, there's research on property prices, residential act, uh, real estate transactions and activity. Um, so ours fits in in terms of uh, looking at residents, which I think is. My sense is that's the fundamental criterion. I and mean, we targeted these places um, based on criteria relating to income and poverty, suggesting we actually were concerned about the low incomes and poverty in these tracks. Um, so that's just what this is. You know, the, I think our, our focus aligns with uh, the program goals and targets. Um, I certainly think it's true, and I'll echo again what Ed said early, not at all clear to me why opportunity zone incentives would be the best way to help zone residents. It's a real estate investment. Ed raised the question, uh, is that complementary with labor generally? And the, the, the more fundamental question, is it complementary with the labor input of the workers or potential workers who live in those zones in the first place, who presumably are fairly unskilled be, uh, because income is low and poverty is high? Uh, briefly, uh, we have restricted access data, <clears throat> uh, which is great. Um, uh, the downside is you have census confidentiality restrictions. Um, uh, there's been quite a bit of disaggregated analysis you've seen in some of the other papers, rural, non-rural. Um, I don't recall if anyone did the contiguous tracts or not, but that's an interesting question. Um, as the last discussant pointed out, uh, our ability to really parse things by year, disaggregated by other dimensions is limited. So census just has rules on how small the units can be for you, which you present results. So what we're showing you here is partly because of timing, is analysis that we knew we could um, get through the confidentiality restrictions without any problems, because we didn't want to come here and say, like you sometimes see with RDC papers, well, we have all these ideas, but we can't get our data, our results out of census yet. And our, our next step, I think, is to is to see what, where we can push um, and, and still satisfy the rules, but present some more disaggregated analyses that are most relevant. Don't know exactly how that will come out yet. 
Uh, we're using track by year data, uh, using person weights. Like the other papers, we focus on designated and eligible tracts. We're restricted to the LIC, so we're not using the contiguous tracts. I agree treatment effects in contiguous tracts are interesting, maybe not as much for residents, um, but the problem is then how do you, you know, what, what, it's not entirely clear what controls you want to use. In that case. You don't want to use all the non-LIC, non-designated tracts as controls. So for now, we're, we're doing a cleaner, I think, um, cleaner analysis. It's most of the tracks, only 3% of designated tracks were not LICs anyways. Um, just some broad descriptives. David, I didn't start my timer yet, so you probably did, but I'm a few minutes behind. Uh, sorry about that, but I just started it. Um, uh, we don't do a lot of, of uh, we don't study all the selection per se, although, although our, our, our research approach takes account of that issue. Uh, what you can see here simply is that the debt, the treated tracts relative to the potential control tracts, that is other LICs that weren't chosen, have slightly lower employment rates by about four percentage points, uh, five percentage point higher poverty rates, uh, and somewhat lower average earnings. Um, that's just the level differences, and it's actually the, the changes pre-treatment that turn out to be um, more interesting. So we start with a simple diff and diff model. Uh, you all know these, you know, you've seen them before. Um, we do vary what we consider the treatment to include 2018 and 19, um, or just 2019. And that's because these kind of took effect mid-2018. You know, we don't know uh, to the extent to which, which place uh, investors were able to respond yet. Um, so, you know, arguably the 2019 treatment period is more sensible, unclear. Um, we can, with these data, estimate highly saturated models. We can put in full sets of either state-by-year dummies, Puma by year dummies, or even county by year dummies, which are generally smaller. Um, um, so, and, and that's not year trends; that's year, that's year fixed effects. So we can we can sort of allow for very arbitrary time series changes um, in in geographies that are somewhat broader than opportunity zone tracks. Obviously, you can't put in track by year dummies because that's where all the variation is. Um, so, but we can saturate these models very heavily. In which case, you're you're effectively narrowing the control tracks. To those in the same geography, Pumas, uh, you know, Pumas or counties being um, being quite narrow, um, and then we can extend it to an event study framework, which is what's at the bottom of the slide, where we just sort of estimate, you know, the the, the deviations between the enders, the opportunities opp and the eligible tracks that weren't chosen in each pretreatment year and each posttreatment year, to kind of see the evolution of the effects. Turns out to be really important, as you'll see. Um, Second, we're still concerned, despite the saturation, and you'll see why, that opportunity zone designation is associated with underlying trend changes. Um, so we use a propensity score matching approach. Here we simply run the 2019, we, we form the double difference 2019 minus 2017. So that's the post-treatment change on the pre-treatment change. And we match on the levels of everything that's in that, of, of all the outcomes uh, for 2013 to 2017. So you're basically matching, obviously, treated treated LICs to the LICs that were most similar on all these outcomes. And we do all of them simultaneously so that as we change dependent variable, we're not changing what the matched control tracks are. Um, should provide more reliable causal estimates. Um, you know, we, we know there's always potential for unobservables, and we don't have a solution to that at this point. Um, and you'll see in this case it matters. So let me just show you the results. This is, this is a pretty easy paper to, to set up and present. So these are the standard uh, diff and diff estimates. And you'll see there's two alternative treatments, opportunity zone in 2019 or 2018 and 19. That turns out not to actually make that much of a difference. Um, uh, so all we have here, I'm showing you the track fixed effects and here I'm showing you the county year fixed effects. So this is, this is the most saturated model. There's more counties than Pumas. Um, uh, and you can see it looks like uh, employment is a, is a count, so that's bodies, right? So it looks like a positive significant employment effect around 26 workers, which is, you know, not trivial. I mean, average employment in track is in the, think of it roughly in the 14 to 1500 range. Um, employment rate, these effects are, you know, a little less than one percentage point. Again, not trivial. Earnings, uh, not clear to draw a strong conclusion from here. One effect significant, one not. And poverty rate looks like about a 1.1 or 1.2 percentage point decline, which again is, is not trivial when poverty rates were, those means were around 25% uh, percent, uh, before. Uh, however, um, big caveat, um, 
these appear to be uh, driven, I think, to a large extent by prior trends. It's not quite as clear in this graph in, in employment levels. You could look at this graph and say the prior trends look pretty good. And maybe in 2019, um, there's, a, there's a positive effect um, in the saturated model estimates. Those are the red ones. Um, employment rate, uh, you know, if you were sort of teaching a methods course and, and issuing a warning about prior trends, uh, this would be a great graph to show. It looks, it looks like, um, you know, yeah, there's some deviation, obviously, but it looks like whatever you're getting on the, the increase in employment rate <clears throat> is a continuation of prior trends. Again, even with, the, even with um, saturating these models um, with the, with the uh, county times year uh, fixed effects. Um, earnings, there's really not much going on anyway, so not as much to say. And then poverty rate, uh, pretty striking graph in terms of, of prior trends. Any treatment effect here really looks like it, it's it's probably the continuation of prior trends. Um, and this is this is consistent, by the way, with um, what we saw. I'm forgetting all the authors of so many papers being presented today, but the the early, I, I guess it was Rebecca's first, maybe the first paper, this the the, the positive selection. Um, of places that were improving. I, they, she had I, I don't, I, a socioeconomic change measure, which I believe she, she and her co-authors, which I believe is sort of an aggregate um, of socioeconomic status, but very consistent uh, with that. So we then switched to matching estimates um, where, uh, you know, so, so now what you want to think about is, is, is we're comparing that double difference, right? 17, uh, 2019 minus 2017, on 2017 minus 2013, and you're comparing that for the treated and controlled tracts, um, and nothing is significant here. The employment effect, the employment effect, the estimate isn't that much smaller. It was around 26 or so before. It's less precise. The employment rate and the poverty rate estimates are not, are not significant, but these are also a good deal smaller than what we had before. They're about they're about half the size um, of what we had earlier. So um, the matching estimator kind of suggests there's nothing going on here. Um, and again, this is 2017-19, so you're getting the the two the you know the the, the two years of post treatment, including the quote unquote full year of 2019. Um, we can actually show you the event study graph uh, matching the treated and control areas, and what they show you is that the matching you know seems to solve the problem. The the, the prior trends result results uh, no longer look problematic. This is employment, which was not as problematic, anyways. But here's employment rate where previously we saw up to 2017, very differential trends for the treated and controlled tracts. Uh, earnings again, looks like, you know, there wasn't much going on anyways. And poverty also where we saw that very strong pre-trend um, uh, favoring the treated versus controlled tracts uh, now goes away. So the matching uh, seems to work here uh, in terms as, you know, as it should, it's not, it's not the only way to do it. You've seen other papers already today doing it different ways, but it's certainly one way to do it. And it does seem to give you places that, that are on a similar similar trend and in particular a similar improving trend uh, in terms of the employment rate and the poverty rate, um, which when you account for that seems to wipe out um, wipe out the gains uh, from opportunities. Two minute warning. Yep. Um, just in terms of uh, magnitudes, uh, kind of what we can rule out if you think about the confidence interval. So this is from our matched estimates, which we think are much more credible. Um, so with 95% confidence intervals, we can at least rule out, I mean, our employment rate effect is positive, 0.4 percentage points, but we can rule out an effect bigger than 1.2 percentage points. Um, the poverty rate calculation is negative, the estimate is negative, um, uh, and we can rule out with 95% confidence uh, reductions bigger than 1.6 percentage points. Um, you know, this is, this is an issue that always comes up, and I think, um, uh, I think maybe it was Robert who mentioned it earlier, you know, uh, we all do significance testing. We want to know whether our effects are significantly different from zero, but we also want to know, are we getting, you know, big point estimates, which after all are the best estimates, um, even when an effect is insignificant, um, and big standard errors that, you know, might lead us to say, oh, there's no significant effect, but there's really big gains uh, to be had here that are consistent with the point estimates. Um, this is always a, an issue that we, I, I don't think we, we deal with that successfully in trying to marry our econometric analyses with policy advice. But I think here the point is um, these are reasonably precise estimates, um, we, you know, and we can we can rule out um, effects that are you know not that big essentially. Um, just to conclude, uh, limited or no statistical evidence of positive effects of enterprise zones. 
Um, I think the estimates are sufficiently precise to rule out substantial effects. The methods matter, and I think everyone knows that, and we've seen uh, some attention to this in one way or another uh, in all the papers, at least for the outcomes we look at, which are outcomes for residents. Uh, the pre-trends seem to badly contaminate the evidence consistent with better, you know, improving places being selected, which is not that surprising, um, perhaps. Overall, I think we contribute to what is so far a picture of mixed evidence. People have looked at different outcomes. They're looking at different data sets. Uh, there's a lot to sort out here uh, as to what's going on. Um, big problem. The evidence is early, um, but the problem is the evidence for the next few years is going to be a very difficult to learn anything from. I mean, I mean Robert had some uh, uh, results on post-COVID, um, but we were having an exchange in the chat about, you know, there's so much else, and he mentioned this, there's so much going on post-COVID, um, it may be hard to figure out. So we may not get much more or better evidence for many years until we think the pandemic is gone. And of course, at that point, other policies will have changed. So it may be hard to tell it was opportunity zone. So. Um, to quote Jack Nicholson, this may be as good as it gets, um, which, which may not be that good, unfortunately. Um, my own view, this is not, this is me speaking for me, not my co-authors, is while I've been a critic of enterprise zones, I don't think they've worked very well. Um, I think uh, there's, still a, there's still a lot we should explore in terms of place-based policies that do really focus on uh, hiring of local disadvantaged residents and thinking about how we can improve those. I think enterprise zones have not failed because they've targeted low-income residents. They failed because they've done a really bad job at targeting low-income residents and creating the right incentives. Um, and if you want to see an interesting exchange on this, Tim, who's the discussant coming up, Bartik and I have a, a recent JPAM exchange on kind of how to improve uh, more local policies, more explicitly focused on incentives for workers and other means of improving employability. of workers. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, David. Um, uh, so we have two discussants. One is the aforementioned Tim Bartik of the Upjohn Institute, who's been thinking about these issues for quite a while. And the other is Aaron Hedlund, who's at the University of Missouri, and who was at the, on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors when they did a evaluation, early evaluation of Opportunity Zones. So we're going to start with Tim and then go to Aaron. Each of them has 15 minutes, and then we'll have time for some Q&A. Okay, can everyone hear me? Can you see my slides? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. I, uh, I really enjoyed reading these three papers. I think all three are excellent papers. And what I wanted to focus on is trying to see uh, if we could compare the results to see if there's any consensus from these. And that's a little difficult because they're all looking at different labor market outcomes. Uh, so there's an apples and oranges problem. So uh, to start out with, what I did was to try to uh, uh, create my own little model. What would I expect based on prior research would be the impact of opportunity zones? Uh, and first, we need to know what the cost of the program is. And uh, I think it'd be nice if we could nail that down. Uh, in the era fever paper, uh, the, there is a range given of 11 billion to 55 billion. I'm going to assume for the purpose of this that the cost is 33 billion, halfway in between that range. I think that's consistent with some estimates I've seen for maybe a 10 year cost of the program from uh, the Joint Committee on Taxation. Um, so then the question is, how much does it cost to create a job in a small neighborhood? Um, you know, for some of the reasons that Ed Glazier already outlined, I don't think that opportunity zones will do as well as empowerment zones for creating jobs. Empowerment zones, if you look at the Busso, Gregory, and Klein paper, the cost per job created is about $11,000 per job created. Um, but that was a very employment focused program. The subsidy was up front. Um, uh, in addition, it provided public services. I've argued in the past that public services might be a better way of creating jobs. So we're not going to do it as well as 11,000 per job. If you look at the business location literature and look at how sensitive businesses are within a metropolitan area to intra-metropolitan variations in tax rates, you might expect from that a cost per job created for of 142,000. I think opportunity zones might beat that at least in terms of federal dollars because obviously state and local areas have put some money in these places too. So let's assume that per federal dollar, we can get a cost of halfway in between those two numbers or $76,000 per job. 
And so if you do that and look at how many jobs there are in these zones, uh, you would get job creation of 430,000 jobs about, uh, that would be about a 1.8% uh, boost in jobs in the zones. Now, how about vacancies that were talked about in one of the papers? Uh, you know, I found one paper that looked at relationships between job growth and vacancy rates, and that got about a three to one uh, relationship. So if you assume that's true, and uh, you would get about a 5.3% increase in vacancies due to zones. Now, here's a key point I want to emphasize, and this is actually something that David Newmark just referred to. What is the impact of zone residents going to be of increasing jobs in the zones? What we're talking about here is mostly just redistributing jobs within the metro area. How much does having nearby jobs make a difference? Um, well, I've done some recent research looking at this at counties versus an overall commuting zone. And the elasticity at the county level holding CZ job growth constant is about a 0.1 elasticity. I would assume it's smaller for a smaller neighborhood. And so I assume for the sake of this analysis is 0.05. That is one in 20 of the jobs created in an opportunity zone will actually uh, go to increase the employment rate of zone residents. And if you assume that, if you have a 1.8% job boost, you divide that by 20, you get a 0.1% increase in the employment rate in the zone for zone residents, the original zone residents. And uh, most of the research on how elastic, you know, how, how wages go up as employment rates go up would get about the same response of wages. You'd get a 0.1% increase in wages. And so overall earnings per capita of zone residents would go up by 0.2%. So that would, have been, that would have been my prior belief about the impact of this program on earnings per capita of zone residents. Now, of course, we actually want to look at the data, see what the data shows. So uh, dealing with the paper in the order in which they're presented, the uh, Siemens paper finds a 3.0% uh, uh, increase in job vacancies. It's not significant. And so by the way, what I do in looking at these things, the stuff that is actually the preferred estimates of the authors isn't bold. The stuff that I'm making up or extrapolating is not in bold and has a question mark after it. So I'm trying to clearly distinguish what the authors are saying from what I'm inferring from what they said. So Siemens says 3.3% increase in uh, job vacancies, not significant. Based on this 3 to 1 relationship, I would expect that would correspond to about a 1% job boost. That would mean 247,000 jobs, about $134,000 cost per job. Um, it would also imply about a 0.1% boost in the employment rate. And now their, their effect on wages is 1.6%, which is actually surprisingly high given the other numbers. It's statistically significant. It, it really seems kind of high. It, it, it doesn't really seem consistent with the other numbers. And so the overall effect on uh, earnings per capita of zone res would be 1.7%. The era fever paper, as was mentioned, their preferred estimate is around 3.8% for metro areas from that, and that, that's statistically significant. And they get about 781,000 jobs created in metro areas, and they get a $14,000 cost per job created. Now, that's based on assuming the cost of the program is $11 billion. If you instead assume $33 billion, you triple the $14,000 to $42,000. In addition, in their paper, and they didn't mention this in the, in the slides, but in their paper, they do uh, some estimates where they employment weight the zones, and they do weighted estimates using employment weights. I actually think that's better for figuring out the overall percentage impact of the program on, on, on than the country as an aggregate. And that number is 1.8% across both metro and non-metro areas. And if you, you would then from that get about a 444,000 uh, job increase and you would get about um, a $74,000 cost per job using the $33 billion figure. Based on a 1.8% job increase, you'd get this 0.1% boost the employment rate, 0.1% in wages, and 0.2% earnings per capita. Finally, the, 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 the Newmarket Tal paper, uh, as was already mentioned, 
um, using his num the numbers from their um, match numbers, not the, the Princeton score match, not the different the straight difference in difference. There is a 0.8 percent boost in the employment rate. That's 0.4 percentage points uh, on a base of about 50 percent. So it's about 0.8 percent. Uh, that's not significant. There's a 1.3 percent boost in the wage rate. Again, that's not significant. But overall, there's a 2.1% increase in earnings per capita implied by this. Again, you can't reject the hypothesis of zero. Um, if you look at the boost in jobs for residents, again, this is for residents, it's 1.4%. That almost surely is an underestimate of the effect on total jobs, though, because not all the jobs will go to residents. So the effect on total jobs in percentage terms should be higher. And again, uh, their estimate that resident jobs would go up in aggregate 182,000. Total jobs should go up more than that. The cost per resident job is 181,000 per job. Again, that's too high. It should be lower than that. So that's my attempt to try to reconcile the different studies. And what I want to point out in terms of a benefit cost analysis is, OK, you might say, uh, and David, in fact, said that, that 2%, this is not a big impact. Well, well, actually, given that the total earnings in these zones is about $500 billion, right? A 2% boost in um, earnings per capita is $10 billion a year. If this program costs $33 billion over a 10-year period, and we're getting a $10 billion boost in earnings for residents a year, this is a wonderful program. Now, that number is not statistically significant. Uh, it's also the case that the Siemens number implies a very large number. And actually, the error fever one implies a pretty low number, which is, is interesting kind of in the sense that I believe listeners listening to this would tend to think that the error fever paper is the most favorable to opportunity zones. and The other two are less favorable. But if you actually look at the effect on residents, I actually think that the point estimates from Newmark and, and the Siemens paper are actually apply uh, higher uh, benefits. Now, of course, a lot of, you know, as the Newmark thing, for example, is not statistically significant, the job vacancy numbers in Siemens are not statistically significant. So part of the dilemma of the Opportunity Zone program is, given the cost of the program, given in some sense it's a small program compared to these areas and compared to their total earnings, you do not actually need a big increase in percentage terms and earnings to have a pretty large number compared to the cost of the program. So that's one key point. And, and that creates some difficulties for empirical work because there's a lot of noise in detecting effect on resident earnings. The other point I wanna mention that, that David kind of alluded to is that, you know, this is we're talking about effects on residents and who the residents are is changing. And so there's this, I guess you would call it composition bias or gentrification bias. And, uh, you know, obviously if the zone is upgrading the, you know, people are moving into the zone who are higher employment rates, higher wage rates, that's gonna bias all these things upwards. And in fact, I kind of think that some of the inconsistencies between some of the different numbers may be due to that, that in fact, there's some of this going on, there's a gentrification bias. So the effect on the actual residents as of the time is not the same as the effect on the original residents, which of course was the purpose of the program. The second problem is what I'll, I'm calling here displacement bias. Um, it has to be the case that most of the jobs created in opportunity zones come from elsewhere in the same local labor market. So for non-export based businesses, restaurants, grocery stores, there's a certain demand for these. If we're putting restaurants or grocery stores or whatever, some kind of stores in these neighborhoods that are non-export based, uh, you know, I think that's one for one displacement from somewhere else in the metro area. Even for export based industries, the evidence pretty overwhelmingly suggests that for export based industries, uh, it's much easier to shift jobs around within a metro area than across metro areas. So 85% uh, of it's going to be within area substitution. And, uh, you know, what I really want to know is, 
you know, actually, uh, the air theater thing got there a little bit in percentage terms. I don't really want to know the percentage effects on tradable goods or, or, or in services. I want to know what share of the jobs created are in tradable goods. So, which is a different question, which was not really answered. What was answered was the percentage effects on different industries. I want to know what share of the created jobs are in different types of industries. And and I also want to know, okay, so the Arafia paper finds that nearby tracks actually gain jobs, but someone in the metro area is losing. I want to know who's losing in the metro area. And it would make a big difference to me in evaluating this program to know whether or not the jobs lost in the metro area are from elsewhere in the city or from the suburbs. And I think we need to look at stuff like that because you know, the, the real question of this program is we're redistributing jobs within the metro area. We're trying to help residents. It, it, it helps some residents in the distressed neighborhoods, perhaps. It, it hurts residents in some other neighborhood. Who are those residents? And, and what is the overall effect within a metro area? So let me just stop there and uh, turn things Great. over to the next discussion. Great. Um, Aaron Headland. Hey there. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and see if that works for everybody. Can everyone see? Yep. Great. Okay. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me on here. It, it was an interesting experience for me because uh, now that I'm back at the University of Missouri and back at the St. Louis Fed, but during 2020, I was at the Council of Economic Advisors and uh, certainly Opportunity Zones was one of the main things we looked at until COVID hit, I and mean, once once COVID hit, <laughs> big shift in attention towards other things. We did still manage to eventually get the report out, and uh, you know a couple of just background points that have really been brought up at various points today, which is you know opportunity zones. You know these are these are poor areas, right? And there are certain eligibility criteria that had to be met for them to be selected, but even relative to tracks that met the criteria, the ones that were actually chosen had lower median household income. And moreover, uh, this is comparing OZ tracks to, to non-OZ non -OZ tracks in general. These are places that are, they're not just doing poorly in a, in a level sense, they're also not going in a very good direction. Uh, now what the CEA did during 2020 is, you know, we looked at things like how much, how much uh, capital we think was raised uh, in, by qual uh, qualified opportunity funds. And we came to an estimate of about 75 billion of which 52 was, was new. Um, but an important thing is that there are delays between just raising the capital and actually deploying it. So we'd expect forward looking variables like asset prices in particular house prices to respond faster than say um, employment. And in fact, the, the CEA report didn't even go into uh, employment estimates really because it was very early on. Um, so, and that graph that I'm showing there is just kind of the graph we hit had in there on increase in private equity in, in OZs. So I'm just gonna kind of go paper by paper with some thoughts and kind of take stock at the end with uh, where maybe there, there could be some interesting discussion between the authors that are here. So uh, in terms of uh, the Atkins paper, you know, Robert's paper, you know, they're looking at job vacancies and posted salaries using burning glass data and roughly speaking, you know, propensity score matching and, and diff and diff. And I take their main findings as you know, not very positive, right, for OZs. You know, no evidence of an increase in job vacancies. You know, there's some salary increase, not super robust. But interestingly, they do find some positive effects uh, post-COVID. And I'm, I'm gonna get to that issue in a moment. So in terms of some thoughts, you know, even before, let's, let's take the, the results at face value. You know, I think we'll have a lot to discuss in terms of methods and, and data and all that. but even if we take those results at face value, kind of going off of what, what Tim just mentioned, it's not entirely clear to me that the interpretation is, is obvious. Um, in particular, the interpretation that the results are small in magnitude, you know, no evidence these do much. Um, even if, for example, we look at the, the wage effects where they had estimates of you know, anywhere from 1.45 in table one to 4.42 in, in the appendix, which I believe was looking at the case for you kind of look at zip codes where 80% of people were in a track that, that was designated. And if you use those, I mean, that basically implies back the envelope earnings increase of eight to 26 billion. Um, and given that, you know, if, if you take as given 
the 52 billion in investment estimated that we did, uh, you know, it's not a bad return, especially since really only a fraction of that investment was actually likely deployed in the 2019 period. Uh, moreover, you could, you know, there was a lot of discussion on clustering. Um, and it's, I think that'd be interesting to have some discussion that I don't claim to be, you know, I, a lot of my research tends to be macro with some micro stuff. I'm not writing papers uh, on the econometric methods to some, you know, to, to great of an extent, but it, it is unclear, you know, how, how aggregate of a clustering, you know, do you want to do? Um, their paper makes the case that, well, design, designation was done at the state level at the, in a, in a very mechanical sense, right? the probability of being designated varied from large states to small states. But my question here, and I think this is brought up early in the morning, was yes, formally speaking, the designation is done at the state level, but it might be important to think about what was the actual assignment mechanism within each state? You know, was it really the governor kind of making these decisions, like not just, not just on paper, but like in actuality, you know, his staff or his or her staff looking at all these, these zones, or you know, was it rubber stamping of, of recommendations by mayors? In which case, you know, it's not entirely clear to me how strong the argument is for needing to cluster at, more, at a larger level. Um, moving away from kind of econometric methods stuff, I think there's another interesting question, which is the, those positive COVID effects, the kind of the 2020 effects that are, are kind of larger in the paper. Is that evidence that somehow opportunity zones were uniquely beneficial in a kind of a crisis environment, meaning that had COVID not occurred, we wouldn't have seen that? Or is it just evidence that the investment, again, took time to actually be deployed and takes time, takes time for companies to hire and all that, and really the employment effect just happened to take place more in 2020 than beforehand it would have happened anyway. Uh, so I think that's you know, an interesting point to, to consider and discuss. Um, some, some smaller points, uh, but, but still useful would be the, you know, Alina's paper, you know, they find a pretty big difference between urban and rural uh, job results. So it'd be interesting to see kind of heterogeneity in this paper, whether that exists between rural and urban. And again, if, if going to that kind of post that 2020 versus 2019, if it, if it is COVID, or if somehow, you know, it doesn't, generally, OZs don't generally create job growth, but somehow they make the, the area more resilient to shocks, then can we look at the data and see, well, were areas that were hit harder by COVID, did they, was there a differential impact of OZs in, in those areas compared to others? Because we know that COVID did not spread around the country uniformly, right? Um, certainly the, the epidemiological variables didn't evolve uniformly. Uh, but even economically, it wouldn't be uniform. So it'd be interesting to kind of explore again whether the co whether COVID is really a relevant factor here, or if it's just a timing issue because it takes delay. Um, I also wonder, since there were pretty different results between kind of the baseline and, and the case where you were looking at uh, zip codes with a larger fraction of people in the OZs, you know, is it possible to look at more continuous treatment stuff? Um, one. Interesting question. I mean, I think one takeaway I'm going to have at the end, which I'll just preview now, is there's these differing results between the papers. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they contradict, but they might. To what extent are these differences driven by methodological differences versus data? Right? We've got burning glass versus the other sources we're going to get to. So one thing that caught my attention was that there's been a statement made that, well, OZs, yeah, they weren't in a good position, but maybe they were rising, right? They were like, on a good trajectory relative to eligible but not selected. Um, and I, I recall seeing in the, in, in the Atkins paper that there was some graphs showing higher income growth um, in, the, in the selected as opposed to the eligible. Then in the Alina paper, I think figure one shows a pretty stark difference between, basically employment growth is worse in the, in the tracks that were selected. So be interesting to know like, what's going on. And uh, in terms of the data issue, you know, I haven't worked extensively with burning glass data, so maybe there's an easy response to this, but I just recall, uh, particularly during the CEA, when we were looking at all sorts, you know, every metric we could just for tracking the economy unrelated to OZs, the burning glass data seemed to me to be pretty wild, uh, at least the, the, the stuff that's, that was posted on the Opportunity Insights website. And so it does make me wonder you know, how reliable and how high quality is the data, given how much it's jumping, this is just you know, over the past year, 
Um, I, I recognize in the back of the, of the Atkins paper, there are some regressions of job postings against the level of employment for QCEW and also kind of zip code patterns. Is that true? But that's a, you're comparing sort of flows versus stocks. Are there ways to, I mean, are the flows from the postings consistent with the flows, kind of the changes in the stocks? Um, I also wonder, you know, this is burning glass, let's say is the, the universe of online job postings. And, you know, Rob, Robert already made the comment about whether there's kind of selection issues because 30 to 40% of the data didn't have wages. But I have a bigger question, even just with the vacancies, if we're talking about low income impoverished areas, to what extent are online job postings a, a great barometer of jobs in general? Uh, so there's kind of questions to bring up there. Uh, switching gears, I'm going to go out of order with uh, the presentations today. So switching to the Friedman paper that, that David presented. Again, now we're switching at we're switching outcomes a little bit, looking at you know, employment earnings and poverty, different data set uh, using the restricted use ACS data. Um, similar kind of bottom line finding, at least the way I interpret it, which is modest effects is kind of the, the thesis. And uh, I have the same interpretation question, which is let's so let's take as given that suppose the results are, you know, the, the, the methods and the data are great. You know, what does it really mean for something to be modest? Uh, well, I mean, if there's a one to one and a half percent employment increase just in 2019, I mean, they were talking, you know, 4.6 to 7.2 billion. Um, if 52 billion of, of, cap, of, of investment was new, how much of that 52 billion was even deployed in 2019? So, I mean, probably a, only a fraction of it. So if you're getting seven, potentially $7 billion of, of uh, earnings from the employment increase off of a relatively modest investment, I mean, it's not entirely clear to me that the return on the investment might actually be decent. Uh, similarly with the, the poverty reduction, not necessarily trivial given how short of a time frame we're looking at. Uh, the earnings results definitely were the weakest, at least that's my recollection, but uh, but again, even if you were to go with, for example, kind of one of the larger estimates, um, you know, that could give you an additional $3 billion. And uh, referring to, again, the, the CEA report, we, we did kind of a comprehensive uh, estimate of likely foregone revenue, taking into account like, literally just the direct impact on revenue, but also offsetting expenditures on kind of means-tested property programs. And we concluded that for each dollar invested, you're losing really only about 15 cents of revenue. And if, if we assume the full 75 billion actually you know, went out there, uh, we're still only looking at 11, $11 billion in foregone revenue. So uh, again, I'm not, it's not entirely clear to me that the results here are, are all that negative, even if you take them at face value. Um, switching gears to is, I do have a question. It says larger effects with more detailed geographic controls, Right, that can reduce bias by accounting for trends. Like that's what the paper mentions, but it could also magnify bias due to the business stealing. But just as there was a difference between what the Atkins paper found, which was that selected places had higher income growth relative to eligible but not selected, and that kind of contrasted with the, the you know, Alina's paper's findings, which that the selected places had worse employment growth, going here, yes, it could you know, maybe magnify bias due to business stealing, but maybe it's the opposite that happened, right? The, the Alina paper finds that there's actually not business stealing, at least in a you know, local sense, there, there might be business stealing from, you know, Tim had, I think, valuable comments about, is it, you know, how broad of an area might these jobs be drawn from versus net increases? But I still think it's, it's kind of worth thinking about whether, uh, you know, to what extent business stealing is happening. Hey Aaron, you've got a lot of slides and you've got like two minutes left. So I want you to think about how you want to- Got it, yeah, want. we'll do it, okay. Um, so it's also a similar question to the Atkins paper. It'd be interesting to break down rural versus urban, extend it to 2020. Um, let me just actually pretty, pretty close to the end here. So let me just switch lastly to the Alina paper. Uh, they look at basically very different data set, but they're looking at employment, not necessarily of residents. They find what appear to be kind of bigger effects. And I just kind of had some questions here as well. You know, um, give, given the very clear there very clearly pre-trends going on. You know, is it use, might there be ways to include some growth measures in the controls? Uh, they do something, I think, that gets at this in table six. They also do a useful placebo test, but I do wonder if, if more might be done. One thing that really stuck out to me though is very large uh, outliers, right? Like the difference, in, I think, in the, in the top panels of figure one that showed employment growth 
when you when you windsorize versus not windsorizing, dramatically different. Similarly, with the OLS versus the quantile regression estimates, so I'd be, be interesting to know like, what is driving the tails. Uh, also, you know how to interpret the larger coefficients for the non-low income places. Um, this wasn't maybe, in my opinion, the central point of the paper, but there's one brief section that talks about the role of politics and selection. I do wonder there, you know, how confounded by, is, is that by rural versus urban, given, given kind of political polarization. Um, and then just kind of taking stocks, taking stock, I think very interesting papers, all of them, frontier methods and data. What I'd love to see is kind of the matrix where you kind of, you take the, the, every combination of the data and the methods from the different papers to figure out what's going on, right? To what extent are differences because of, of the data versus the different methods? Um, and there's also kind of two different things you can, you can look at, right? How much investment occurred and then what's the impact of that? And I think when you're talking about policy evaluation, we need, it, it is important to interpret, you know, what is a good versus bad return on investment? Like what, what's the proper way to think about that? You wanna measure outputs relative to inputs. If there's not a whole lot of foregone revenue, then even a modest absolute effect by some metric might actually be not so modest. So uh, I'll finish up there. Thanks. I think what we'll do is I'm gonna collect the questions we have and then I'm gonna let the authors respond. So as uh, we said, uh, you can email events at brookings.edu or you can email me directly at Dave D. Wessel at brookings.edu or if you're in the Zoom room, put it on the chat. Um, Michael Novogratik asks a question are there any thoughts on the impact of the 2020 census boundary changes on ongoing research using census data to evaluate <coughs> the economic effect of OZ designation? He says, this has surprised me, that nearly 60% of the 2010 census tracts designated as OZs have 2020 boundary changes. Um, uh, uh, Jeremy Weber notes that to be clear, the uh, CEA estimate of 11 billion, I believe is present value and federal revenue loss from the $75 billion in nominal investment OZ funds does not include any savings from reduced poverty or transfers from the federal government. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I'm going to wait one moment. Otherwise, I'm just going to go right to the authors and we can go to lunch. Um, so uh, with that, why don't we just take the authors in the order which they spoke, uh, and you can respond to anything you want, but please don't respond to everything. Uh, so Rob Siemens, um, defend so, Yeah, uh, th thanks, David. Um, I I'm not going to respond to the questions. I don't have much to say on those. I think they're great questions. I just don't have much to say on those. Um, I, I just wanted to respond uh, uh, to one thing to the uh, discussants. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, you. You gave certainly us a lot to think about, and I'm sure the other authors as well. Um, I, I just wanted to respond to one of uh, Aaron's comments on the burning glass data. Um, th this is high quality data and it, and it does a good job of tracking uh, what's happening with employment. I take your point about how we could do a better job of that, of sort of showing that in our paper. And so point well taken on that. Um, but if you were to take that time series that you put up, uh, you know, showing around COVID the drop in job postings and, you know, overlay on that, for example, the CES employment data, um, you'd find that it, it, it tracks it really, really closely. This is what Lena Khan and others did, for example, in a, in a paper. So again, I just, I just want to emphasize that the burning glass data is, it, it's good data, it's high quality data. Great. Lena? Uh, thank you so much for fantastic uh, uh, discussions. I think I learned so, so much from them. Um, I'm not sure I'm able to address all, all the great comments, but um, I think a lot of distinction, um, at least between um, our paper and uh, David, David Newmark and co-authors comes from the fact that we're looking at um, establishments in, in those tracks versus they're looking at, sorry, employment in establishments in the track versus they're looking at employment of residents who live in the tract. And even with pre-trans, we can see completely different pictures, right? So they're, they're showing that they're on a positive trend versus in our paper, we can clearly see that everyone was on a downward trend uh, that were parallel. And then when the policy hit, uh, the tracks that were designated uh, experience uh, bigger increases in employment uh, versus the tracks uh, that uh, were eligible but not designated. So I feel like some of the difference is coming from that. Um, and I'm also interested in uh, looking at uh, some of those effects, including uh, you know COVID or 
um, as uh, was asked in the chat on um, changes in the census track, but uh, we, we need to wait for our data until April. <laughs> so that's, that's when we got our previous data for 2019. Uh, but once we have that, we'll be able, may be able to address that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for comments. Uh, uh, we need to think about them. Uh, Nancy on Park, do you want to add anything or subtract anything? Oh, no, it was really a lot of learning for me to about how to reconcile the result, different results from different papers. And I'm pretty sympathetic with the comments that it could be partly coming from the methodology or coming from the, the fact that we're focusing on the different sample. And that's why we added this um, propensity score matching result as well. But we also might want to look at the result only focusing on the um, low income community and rural and combining rural and urban area too and do the rest of the analysis again to see um, whether this difference is coming from the sample too. Thank you. Uh, David Newmark? Just, just two quick comments. One is, you know, I mean, we all know this, but just for other people listening, um, you know, the, the, the point estimates are relevant and, 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 and as Aaron points out, they are obviously because they're positive, consistent with a positive return on investment, whatever, whatever the exact magnitude, but the fact they're insignificant means there's a good chance they're also negative. Um, or, or very close to zero. So we, we want to keep that in mind, right? This is not, statistical significance is not irrelevant here. Um, and the clustering issue, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I, this, this, this new paper that you cited, Aaron, I, I agree is, it's interesting. I think it was surprising to everyone that you can be too conservative because I think the, the folklore before that was it never hurts to cluster. Um, I don't think we quite understand what we should be doing yet, especially in panel data. I would say though, in, in this context, we have a spatial issue. Right. Um, and 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 clustering at the state level, you know, allows allows for sort of what we call in the time series dimension, arbitrary autocorrelation patterns, but in the spatial dimension, arbitrary spatial patterns. And therefore, I think seems like the right thing to do, although it's not really taken up in that paper, to the best of my knowledge. Um, uh, the only the only other question is maybe Alina has time to respond if, if, if allowed. Um, um, I, 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 I'd love to hear more about the your economy data. I don't know much about them, but I was struck by, and we were having a chat, um, uh, the downward trends in employment in the, in both the treated and control tracts up until 2017, maybe I'm wrong. I thought employment was kind of booming everywhere. So if you look at like CBP, the aggregate to the county level, do the your economy data match those data well or, or, or not? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we do see that persistent trend, uh, no matter how we look at it. Uh, we didn't compare explicitly with um, either, either, as I said, because other papers are doing that. And it seems like, um, you know, the, the data is pretty consistent with other data sets, uh, but we didn't compare directly. Um, if, if you feel like that's very different, we can try doing that. <laughs> if we have access, of course, you guys are uh, well, you, can just, you, can aggregate your, you can aggregate your data to the county level and look at county business patterns and just see if those trends look the same. I don't know if your economy has some lag in getting data and maybe that's why it looks like that. I don't really know. I work with the Nets, which is not the same, but has, you know, related sorts of issues. So it might be worth looking. Okay. Matt, for you, yeah. you want to weigh in on anything? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, thank you for the amazing comments. This was really uh, super informative and gave us a lot to think about. Um, definitely. I think uh, as kind of came up at the end of Aaron's discussion and also in Tim's, like, you know, on the surface, it may seem like there's some kind of contradictions, but I think when you dig a little bit deeper here, I think it's possible to reconcile a lot of the results that are coming out in all these papers in terms of differential trends, just given, again, as Alina mentioned, one is measuring changes in employment uh, in, in the tract or the number of jobs uh, in the tract, and, and others are looking at conditions of residence uh, in, in the tracts. And I think it's very possible that those are moving in different directions ahead of uh, OZ designation. Um, and I think, uh, again, you know, I think that the, the questions that we're answering are somewhat different here uh, uh, and the outcomes that we're looking at are somewhat different. That's not to say, of course, that we shouldn't be really trying to think about reconciling um, these results and, and uh, trying to understand both, I think, the impact on employment in these areas, and then, of course, the impact on residents, which, which again, might be quite different. So um, I think that was great. I'd also like to just echo, again, something that came up in all the discussions, which was, you know, we can look at, of course, the effects on the designated tracts themselves, 
but there's all sorts of you know spillovers we might be concerned about again as tim emphasized i think really well um that might imply that sort of from a social perspective right the impacts of these zones are uh, maybe in fact very different <laughs> um and uh, that's hard to get a handle on uh uh here um yeah, because we don't necessarily know, it's not obvious where the investment would have happened had it not been um, shifted or displaced to, to these opportunity zones. And then uh, to highlight one more last thing that I thought was great in Brett's discussion uh, earlier was just, uh, and I appreciate very much, Aaron, your discussion of this too, is that, you know, we've just had a really hard time thinking about the cost of the program um, and, you know, how to map that on to our results and think about ROI. So your discussion was really helpful here. And I think it's just a, it's kind of a lack of information out there and a lack of data collection that's hindering uh, some, some progress on that, on that particular point. Um, uh, so Tim Bardock had a comment and then I just want to put one last question on the table uh, where, uh, which goes to your last point, which is Jeremy Weber, who's one of Aaron's uh, colleagues from the CEA days asks, is the return on investment on foregone tax revenue the most relevant return for policy evaluation. But Tim, uh, you you wanted to speak? Be sure you unmute yourself. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, well, that's my point is I think the easiest way to reconcile the findings would be if the effect on resident wages, and as pointed out, the point estimates in some sense, well, they're either large or small, but they're large compared to the cost of the program, uh, is to think that there are upward bias by gentrification bias. Because uh, otherwise, it's hard to see how if you have a program that only boosts overall employment by 1.8%, that it would boost employment rates and wage rates by the amounts uh, found in the other two studies. Uh, I just don't see how you'd get that. You, you, this, is a, this is redistributing jobs in the metro area. There's no way you'd get that boost. And to, that, that all the, these jobs are not, people don't live and work in the same neighborhood. I mean, you know, so, so, so the effects on the neighborhood of plopping jobs down the neighborhood just can't be that great. So I think it's got to be some gentrification bias uh, going on here. And uh, I don't know how you get around that. I mean, obviously, you'd need some longitudinal data where you follow the same residents over time. So I think it's very tough. Okay, does anybody want to take Jeremy's question on is return on investment based on foregone tax revenue, which I'm not sure we've estimated well, uh, the most relevant way to look at this? Guess not. All right. Well, I, can, uh, oh, I guess ahead, I, th I, think, I think that's fine. I mean, what, what, what would be the benefit cost analysis of this? I mean, you know, this is a federal government program. Uh, it costs the federal government so much in dollars. I think you might want to add in the state and local investments in the program, right? And then you want to compare that with uh, social benefits. What are the social benefits? Well, I, you know, this kind of gets into the thing that David Newmark referred to. What's the purpose of this program? I think, uh, I think that on the revenue estimates, if you're going to be do the overall thing, you have to look at lost state revenues, some states right. revenues. And then we don't really know because we don't know what's happening after the 10th year, how much foregone tax revenue there really is. We're making guesses. Right. I'd like to see a really good cost estimate of this program. What does this program really cost the public sector in aggregate? What's right. the present value of the cost? I mean, actually, we should have a whole other paper set of papers on that. Right. And, and then we need to talk about what are the benefits of this program? I mean, is it really a program aimed at benefiting residents, the original residents, by increasing their earnings per capita? Or does this program have some other purpose altogether? It's trying to... Um, uh, increased property values. It's trying to help city government finances somehow by redistributing activity from the suburbs to the city or something. So I think we need to decide what are we trying to do with this program in terms of benefits and try to measure that. I mean, the implicit assumption of kind of this whole session is that we are aiming at labor market benefits. But since the program doesn't target employment, it seems like the structure of the program is not necessarily optimized to do that. Ed Glazer kind of referred to that at the top and so did David Newmark. If we're trying to aim and increase the employment rates and wages of residents, it's not obvious that Opportunity Zones is optimally designed to do that. Tim, if only someone was writing a book to cover all these angles. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Over to you, David. Did you want to respond, Aaron? You looked like you were contemplating, no? All right. Okay, um, I, this has been jam-packed. I'm learning a lot about how much can you pack into one conference and we're not even done yet. We're gonna take a break and resume at 
1.40 p.m. with a couple of case studies and then a discussion of property price effects, which, uh, as Tim noted, uh, some people think might be the what this is really about. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody for being so cooperative and so uh, efficient at using Zoom. And we'll see you all at 1.40 p.m. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.